you, you need that situational awareness when you're on the scene, when you're on the ground, when you're doing the job. That's what keeps you alive. That's what keeps you safe. That's what, that's what enables you to do your job to the absolute best you can do it. But you also need that situational awareness before and after that scene so that you're looking out for one another, caring for one another, and you can spot what are the warning signs that people are struggling with this. Coming up, we interview Dr. James Densley discussing his book, The Violence Project, How to Stop a Mass Shooting Epidemic. Hello and welcome to the Situation Awareness Matters show, episode 389. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision making for individuals and teams who work in high risk, high consequence, time compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you see the bad things coming in time to prevent bad outcomes. Today's feature segment is sponsored by Gasaway Virtual Training. There are 33 online training programs for you to choose from. Some of the programs are live events presented virtually, and some of the programs are pre recorded. To learn more, visit the essaymatters.com website and click on the virtual training tab. Okay, let's jump into our feature segment, our interview with Dr. James Densley discussing his book, The Violence Project, How to Stop a Mass Shooting Epidemic. Everyone, Rich Gassway here, host of the Situation Awareness Matters show. I'm really excited for two reasons today. One is the first time we're going to have one of our certified master instructors actually serve as the as the host of this um, the feature segment and and conduct the interview. So that's really exciting. Drew, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Good to have you. And we also have Dr. James Densley, who is going to be talking with us about uh, a book that he wrote called Pro the, the Violence Project, uh, How to Stop the Mass Shooting Epidemic. And uh, Dr. Densley is connected with Drew through uh, teaching the Drew Dust through Metropolitan State University where Dr. Densley is, is a program chair there. So Dr. Densley, uh, thank you for taking some time and joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me on the podcast. So I'm going to, I'm going to pass it over to Drew, but I'm going to, I'm going to get the chance to ask the very first question and then, and then Drew will take the rest of the protocol. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you uh, started your interest on this topic and worked your way up to where, where you are today with the university and, and different things related to incidents of violence. Uh, sure. Yeah. So um, as you mentioned, I'm a, a professor and a department chair at Metropolitan State University, which is based in St. Paul, Minnesota. But uh, your listeners might uh, catch that my accent is not from Minnesota. Uh, so I'm originally from the United Kingdom. Um, and I would say if you really take a step back in my trajectory of how I got to where I'm at uh, with the type of research that I do, uh, I'd say it really starts all the way back with the home and my family and as much that my dad uh, was a law enforcement practitioner for uh, 25 years. My sister uh, is still uh, a police officer. She is a homicide investigator, um, both back in the United Kingdom, uh, this is. And then when I went to university, I realized I'm kind of interested in this work, but I don't really see myself as a, as a police officer or as a first responder, but I certainly want to do work in that area. And I, I, I think it's such valuable work and so important. And so I became a sociologist. Um, and so I studied um, criminal behavior, basically, um, and why people do the things that they do with a little... Um, side uh, gig, if you will, where I was a school teacher for a few years. So uh, I actually taught in the New York City public schools. Uh, I was a special education teacher for a few years. And that's what really got me interested actually in youth violence. And that's where I think you see the, the trajectory in my work, which 
starts to look at youth violence, starts to look at gangs, organized crime and some other aspects. And then eventually sort of evolves into looking more uh, around violent crime in general. And then this the thrust of this work that we're talking about today, which is on mass shootings. Uh, and so I'd say for the last four or five years, really focused on active shooter, mass shootings, uh, gun violence uh, in the United States. And, and that's really been the focus. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, it's a sad topic to talk about, but it's uh, an important one and especially important for your listeners, you know, who are first responders um, and uh, are faced with, the, with these tragedies. And so it's great to have the opportunity to talk about it. Awesome. Thanks, James. Well, uh, just kind of talking about that, you have a new book out and uh, it's called The Violence Project, How to Stop a Mass Shooting Epidemic. Um, I've listened to it on Audible. It was fantastic. I learned a lot from it. Um, so with that, you built a database of these mass shooters, uh, but also interviewed some of them. Can you tell us kind of about how that went down and uh, how the interviews went? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, the, the academics call it a mixed methods study in as much that uh, it combined both this database research. So what, what we're trying to do with this is get a grip on how many of these individuals even are there. Um, and it sounds strange to think that we didn't have good numbers, but, um, but, but we really didn't. But beyond even tallying the number of mass shootings, also trying to think about, okay, who were these individuals? So in, in the work that we do, and it's imperfect definition, but we, we define a mass shooting as four or more people killed in a public space. That's a definition that the FBI has used for a long time. It's a very common definition, but as I mentioned, it's imperfect because really whenever multiple people are shot, uh, whether they live or die, I mean, that's a tragedy that's worthy of our attention and our action, of course. And when you think about active shooter scenarios, you can have active shooters that don't kill four people um, and they would still require the types of responses that we're talking about. But still, just to kind of get a feel for the, the, the nature of this, we built a database, we looked at about 180 mass shooters going back to 1966 to the present day. And then we coded them on about 150 different life uh, history variables. So we looked at their background, their childhood, their education, their parents, uh, how they got access to firearms, their mental health history. Uh, we even built a database of the victims of these uh, shootings to sort of uh, uh, remember those. Um, so it's a really a big picture look at this. But in addition to the database, we were able to get some funding from the National Institute of Justice, which is the research arm of the Department of Justice. And that enabled us to take the research beyond just the coding of public data to actually talking to people. So we wrote letters to incarcerated mass shooters, people who perpetrated these crimes who were behind bars for the rest of their lives. And we asked them, would they be willing to talk to us? And we were shocked that five eventually did. Um, so we did a series of life history interviews with these individuals. Um, we wrote letters back and forth where we asked them questions and they wrote back to us. And those letters are actually in the book. Uh, you can see their exact words, what they wrote back to us. And then we also interviewed everybody in the orbit of these shootings to try and get the, the biggest uh, 360 perspective on it. So we interviewed uh, family members of the mass shooters. We interviewed survivors of mass shootings. We interviewed uh, parents who'd lost loved ones to these tragedies. And then we also interviewed first responders about their experiences of being on the scene of these particular events. So we're looking at this from that very um, uh, sort of holistic perspective. And that's the data upon which the book is, is based on. Okay. And I mean, as a police officer, we train in this, um, you know, in active shooter events and it has came a long ways um, since when I first started to now, I mean, just we used to have, you know, tactical response where it was we didn't even go in uh, from Columbine um, because it was, we just weren't prepared for it. Um, then we were, you know, teams of four diamond formation, that kind of deal can't go until we have that. To now we're in single officer approach. But I'm just kind of curious what drew you to the topic, you know, that kind of deal and uh, what this kind of sort of work, what drew you to do this? 
yeah, I think what it was, it, it felt like the, the we every time one of these shootings occurred, there was this sort of sense that it was somehow inevitable and that it wasn't preventable. And that we also, I was just getting frustrated, if I'm honest, with the sort of the way in which the media, the politicians, the so-called experts were always sort of pitting off of each other like these imperfect solutions and then using that as a way to say well then we can't do anything about it so you know it was like well it, it, it's the guns on one hand and then it was it's mental illness on the other hand and but it was never sort of like well can we have a, a serious adult conversation about this and see if we can do something about it right so it was a, really a way of thinking okay how are we going to kind of move the conversation along with this with a real emphasis on prevention, because what we had seen is, and you, your question kind of alluded to this, was we'd finally got to a point where I felt like the reaction or the response to the shootings was starting to become more solid. We, we had a decent evidence base for understanding what is it exactly that somebody needs to do in the event that an active shooting is going on at that moment, what does law enforcement need to do? How do they enter the building? How do they make sure that they uh, get survivors out? Uh, how do they neutralize the threats? That type of stuff. We, we, we had pretty good information about that. But for me as a sociologist and my co-author, Gillian Peterson, is a psychologist, um, we were thinking, how do we get on the front end of this and prevent it so that someone doesn't go into that building in the first place and perpetrate this crime. And so that became our emphasis and, and where we wanted to put a lot of our time and attention. And, and I think it really just comes from a genuine desire to want to change the conversation about this and prevent violence. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. You know, I, I think we're all fed up with seeing these tragedies play out on our, on our news uh, screens, but also in our communities. And, and I just felt, I felt compelled to want to try and do something about it. Absolutely, yeah, and that's what drew me into with my business too, is helping individuals because of this. And it seems like it just keeps increasing and we keep seeing more and more of these happening every day. I mean, I remember back to when it was Columbine, it was the biggest, it, it really shocked everyone because we hadn't seen this. And now it seems like, you can't go a week without seeing these kind of things. So I just want to get back to uh, you mentioned earlier that you uh, wrote letters and had letters returned to you. Um, did you notice anything in common with the shooters that you did interview? I mean, I know you said that there's not exactly a profile uh, with the shooters, but did you notice anything in common between the people that sent you these letters back and talked to you about this and people you interviewed? We did. And that was one thing that was really important because it helped us kind of shift our mindset around how do we go about prevention. So we essentially saw that these mass shooters tended to have sort of four things in common. So the first was that many of them had experienced adverse childhood experiences or early childhood trauma, I think is the way to think about it. And it was often awful trauma. I mean, they'd experienced, uh, you know, uh, physical or sexual violence uh, they had um, maybe had parental suicide in their backgrounds. And it was often intergenerational, by the way, as well. So this was not just the parents, but it was the grandparents and, and it had gone, gone on through time. So that was one key thing. Now, of course, millions of people across the world experience trauma, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to become a mass shooter. But what we did find is that that, if untreated and undealt with, creates a bit of a foundation for sort of what happens next. Because every mass shooter in our study, uh, so, well, nearly every, I should say, um, reaches a sort of identifiable crisis point. They're in, they're in a crisis. Um, it's a personal crisis. It's often a suicidal crisis. Mass shootings are almost as much as a suicide as they are a homicide. Uh, in some cases, these individuals are not intending to get away with it. They often end one of sort of three ways, which is that they take their own life on the scene or their life is taken for them by law enforcement. Or they end up spending the rest of their lives in prison. Um, it's not the sort of crime that you come back from, if that makes sense. 
So you take that and you think about how people were actively suicidal before they even did this. And then those outcomes, you start to see there's an overlap there in terms of this crisis being a, a, a final act, a way of getting back at the world because there's a grievance and that's what they're looking to do. The third piece about this is that mass shooters study other mass shooters. So there is this um, sort of trend where we see individuals inspired by past mass shooters, not just in the, in the case of like, this is a copycat crime or that you're sort of borrowing the symbology of these previous crimes. Columbine was one you'd mentioned earlier, which, you know, th there's an entire subculture in the darkest corners of the internet that celebrates Columbine. Um, but even more than that, if you are somebody who's experienced trauma, if you are somebody who's in a crisis, and it might be a suicidal crisis, you're looking for sort of models of behavior and ways to make sense of your world. And so you're looking for ways to kind of hang yourself on this, uh, this framework. And so what that looks like is you identify with the past mass shooters. You're like, wow, they're just like me. They felt like I did. Um, and, and their solution to that problem was to perpetrate a mass shooting. So perhaps that should be my solution too. There is a true like identification that goes on, which I think is really quite powerful when you think about uh, more than just copycat crimes, if that makes sense. But it's sort of like you're, you're actually locating yourself within this. It also explains why people get sort of radicalized into hate violence and, and, and hate crimes and stuff like that, because in some ways the ideology doesn't even matter. Like it could be, it's white supremacy or it's this, that, and the other. It doesn't really matter. Nobody who's living their fulfilled best life decides that morning, like, oh, I'm going to join ISIS. You know, it, it just doesn't happen that way, right? You, you are living a pretty poor life uh, and you're pretty angry at the world if that's your solution. So this is, there's a sort of script for this violence is that third thing. And then the fourth thing is opportunity. And what that plays into is both access to firearms is a, is a major issue, but not in the controversial sense, because we know that that's such a fraught issue within American society. So let me give you an example. 80% um, of school shooters get their guns from family members. So something as simple as safe storage, if you are living with teenagers who are in crisis, could save lives. Okay. So something very simple like that is, is, is a preventative measure. And then the other thing about opportunity is, and this is something that really feeds into that situational awareness component of the work that uh, Richard and yourself do uh, on day in, day out, which is access to people and access to places. And so if you think about that situational kind of crime prevention framework, that's really where that comes into play. So we look at those four things, childhood trauma, crisis point, the kind of studying of other mass shooters, and then opportunity. They're all inflection points. They're all opportunities for prevention and for intervention. And if we think of them in that way, we can save lives. Good. And kind of to your point with that, with the breaking point, crisis point, um, and where you kind of get to that suicidal point, would you say that could be coming from um, and I don't know if this was, you saw this like as a pattern with some of the people you talked to, but like a divorce or a job loss, or um, maybe it's someone that's been just bullied so much that they just hit that point where they almost dehumanize others. Is that kind of where that, and it can, it depends on the individual themselves that might happen when they're 16 or 32, or it can kind of be all over the place. Yeah, Drew, you've nailed it. That's exactly it. So what's actually quite remarkable about this is we see, particularly in workplaces, the grievance comes from the workplace. So the breaking point often is you've been fired or you've been reprimanded or you didn't get that promotion that you wanted. In a school setting, the grievance comes from the school. It's the you know, you're failing out of classes, you're being bullied by your peers, you've, you've reached that breaking point, you've had enough. Now, and we see this as well in uh, college and university settings, just like K-12 school settings. We even see it in places of worship as well. In places of worship, you either target the place of worship because it's, sim it's some, somehow symbolic 
of the types of people you're trying to a, a, a get. You know, so if it's an anti-Semit uh, um, shooter, um, they're going to attack a, a Jewish synagogue, for instance. If it's, um, you know, if you're looking at somebody who's trying to uh, a attack a certain population, you might pick a certain church or something like that. But often the grievances also were from within. So we often see with these church shooters, they're also targeting family members and friends because they know where those people are going to be on a Sunday morning. So it's part of that routine of, of, of life. Here's the key takeaway from all of that. In those settings, places of worship, workplaces, uh, K-12 schools, colleges, universities, mass shooters tend to be insiders, not outsiders. And that may seem terrifying to be thinking about, these are the same people that are going through the same active shooter drill that I am, or that the same person that walks through that front door every day with the, with the ID card that lets them get through the, uh, the checkpoint. You know, that may sound, from a situational awareness standpoint, pretty terrifying. The flip side is, it's actually really kind of cool because these are people you see every day. They're people you know. They're your colleagues, they're your friends, they're your family members. So it means for us, if we want to save lives, we also have to have that situational awareness of what's going on in the lives of my colleagues. How are they doing? Let's check in. Is Bob having a, a divorce right now? Is he having a hard time right now? Was, this, was Steve passed up for the promotion? Let's keep an eye on everybody so that we're attuned to, we notice when they hit that crisis point. We define a crisis as a marked change in behavior from baseline. So what does that mean? If you're always angry and then you come to work and you're angry, that ain't a change, right? right. That's just Bob being Bob, right? If you're always angry and then you show up and you're really happy one day, you might think intuitively, well, that's a good thing. But actually, that's such a radical change that you might want to just check in and say like, hey, what's going on? Uh, we notice you're different today, right? So it's really about being attuned to everybody so that we are looking out for one another. And, and it's really part of that creating a culture within a workplace, within, within a community where we care about our neighbors and our friends and our colleagues so that we notice when things are going bad, not just because they might become a mass shooter, but because that's also just good to help people get through their day, get through their lives and take care of one another. And so that's one of the big messages of the book is that sometimes this is really quite simple um, and that relationships matter and, and connections matter. Okay. And I mean, obviously it sounds like from a pub public safety standpoint, I mean, as police officers, firefighters, um, EMTs, we're not exempt to this at all because we, we have a very high stress job. We work together quite a bit. We get to know each other really well. Um, and it just seems to me, it's almost kind of the opposite of when you have like a sexual predator, that's someone that you're trying to kind of push away and say, Hey, that's enough, that kind of deal, stay away. But this is more you almost want to include these people in if you see them and they're having a very depressive state or they're not acting themselves kind of like your example with Bob, if that's a fellow firefighter, or that's a fo uh, fellow EMT, you want to, Hey, come have lunch with us. Let's talk or, you know, include them in things. And that can help possibly with the prevention of that from happening. Yeah. It, it, and again, it sounds so simple and it sounds um, almost like, uh, you know, it couldn't possibly be that easy. Right. But it is part of this broader sort of culture and climate around kind of wellness and how we take care of one another. And it's so important for first responders. Um, you know, this is an ongoing conversation when we think about how do we look after one another? How do we check in with each other? How do we break down the barriers as well to be having those open conversations and making sure that it's okay to talk about these types of things? But, it, but I think it's so important because... What we're essentially saying is, look, we're all human beings at the end of the day, and people go through rough periods. And if we can spot that before it becomes a crisis, before it becomes a problem, then we might very well be able to divert somebody off of a pathway that, because as I mentioned before, 
these horrific acts of violence are just as much suicides as they are homicides. So if we apply what we've learned from suicide prevention to violence prevention in general, the two things line up uh, really well. So, um, so a lot of it just comes down to that idea. You know, the other thing that was interesting in the book, we interviewed what we would call averted shooters. So these were people that in some cases like brought a gun in a backpack to school and their intention was to murder their classmates, but they just didn't do it, right? When we asked them, you know, like, well, why didn't you do that? Nearly nine times out of 10, it was, it was nearly always, the answer was somebody showed that they cared. You know, somebody just reached out and showed that they love me or so that they cared about me or asked me that question. And it made me realize that maybe life was worth living after all. And sometimes it can be those really simple things, which are such a game changer uh, in this way. And we've also talked to people who uh, are in some cases, first responders on the scene, although perhaps they weren't trained to be. So like it's school principal or a school teacher or someone like that where a kid's in school with a gun, they want to perpetrate a shooting. They show up and they're able to de-escalate that situation. Not with necessarily the most fancy de-escalation skills like a law enforcement or, or, or first responder you know, professional would have, just simply because they knew the kid. It was, a, it was the relationship that they were able to say, look, we're not doing this today because I know you and you know me and I care about you. And we've got to we've got to bring this down, and we're going to help. And too often, I think we have a, like a punitive response to this, where it's like that kid just needs to be thrown in prison, and and uh, you know they're making a threat, and we need to deal with it, right? And instead, you realize that actually that this is a cry for help in some cases, that they're making a threat because they want people to notice, and they want somebody to intervene and say you don't need to pull that trigger. So we've got to make sure that we're paying attention enough that they never do. Okay, and that's kind of one of the deals that we see our coworker being that one of the biggest keys in prevention is just having that conversation with them and being just decent, nice people to each other around the workplace. I mean, that's, it, it sounds so simple, but in fact, I mean, sometimes we get just so busy with work or we just don't pay attention to those key warning signs coming in. And in fact, it's one of the biggest parts of prevention. I mean, we could try to put as many curved hallways or metal detectors, all that, but it just seems like the biggest thing with our coworkers and our, you know, fellow brothers in blue or firefighters, EMTs is we can just talk to them and be decent with each other and help each other out that way. And it's, it's interesting. You mentioned, you know, the warning signs as well. Like there's, there's an old adage that, you know, the CIA used to live by, which is, you know, that you're uh, it's basically trust your gut. Mm -hmm. you know, if it feels wrong, it is wrong. And that's one of those key things in situational awareness to some degree that we, you hear all the time, right? That sixth sense that you have, that feeling uh, that's almost hardwired into us, right? Biologically, mm -hmm. that if it feels wrong, it is wrong. Trust that operational antennae that is your gut, right? Now, we use that all the time in those high stress situations that first responders deal with day in, day out, whether you're a firefighter going into a burning house, whether you're a law enforcement professional going into an active shooter situation, whether you're an EMT going into a, a car wreck or whatever it is, you know, that sixth sense is there, right? Well, use that same thing, right? If it feels wrong, it is wrong. If, if you're looking at one of your colleagues and something feels really off, there it is. That's it. That's the calling right there. That's the yeah. that's the alarm bell ringing, and that's the moment where, you know, we want to be able to uh, to do that. And then when you think about the whole the the other classic adage in this space is you know if you see something say something. Well, again, the same rules apply, right? It's knowing what are those lines of communication. Who do I talk to? Not because I'm trying to get somebody in trouble, just because I'm worried about them. Sure. So, so it's sort of, okay, I've seen this thing on social media. Somebody posted something weird on Facebook, you know, or somebody in the office today was, was acting strange, you know, and it, it's just not like them. It feels off, right? 
there's that same thing again. If you see something, say something. Who are you going to talk to? Who, who's the supervisor or the professional that you can relay that information back? So we can just have a check-in just to say like, hey, people are a bit, bit worried about you. You sure everything's okay? Open up that conversation and, and hopefully you could, uh, you know, you could uncover that there is something going on. It might not be the, a plot to murder your uh, colleagues, it might, but it might be that this person is really struggling with their mental health right now and needs some help. Good point. And I just remember in your book when uh, I was listening to it on my way home and that audible version and hearing that just that was so incredible. I remember that piece where uh, just having that counselor, I think it was her teacher that was talking to that student. He had the gun in his backpack and, you know, got that away from them because they identified those warning signs and prevented something catastrophic from happening. That was pretty cool. Um, how does this kind of fit in with the whole idea of a threat assessment? Actually, it fits in really well. Um, the one thing I think that's always a bit of a struggle with threat assessment in general is we fixate on the word threat. And so sometimes if it's not an imminent threat to self or others, we maybe say, well, it doesn't quite fit the definition. So we can sort of chalk it off as being dealt with, if that makes sense. I think the one thing we think for us is if instead of it being a threat assessment, it was something more like a, a care assessment or a crisis assessment, if you will, where you could say, OK, this individual is not necessarily a threat to self or others in terms of, you know, they've got the gun in the backpack and this is an imminent uh, risk, but they do need some help and support. There's something going on here that's not that's not right. Can we get them connected to some resources, some services? Uh, can we check in and then also follow up and make sure that, that that's been done? So I think in theory, the idea of threat assessment is actually central to this. It's just in terms of how it comes out in practice to ensure that it's done at the optimal level. I mean, the one thing we always know about this, it goes back to that, if you see something, say something thing, right? After 9-11, it was when we knew the CIA knew something, we knew the FBI knew something, and we knew local law enforcement knows something, but nobody was talking to one another, which is why we built you know, a whole Homeland Security apparatus, right? After Columbine, it was very similar too. The, the, the conversation after Columbine was, everybody had little bits of the puzzle but they hadn't put them together to see the big picture. Mm. So when you think about threat assessment, when you think about that process, it's about pulling together all the information, getting people talking to one another so that you can then, you know, uh, see the big picture and do something uh, about it. And what you want to do is empower people so that they will speak out, that they'll trust the process, that they will think, you know, um, because one of the biggest barriers now is they don't want to be a snitch. You know, I don't, I don't want to be a snitch. I don't want to be telling on people, you know, you've got to break down those barriers. You've got to build the culture within a workplace or within a school or wherever it is that you're operating so that it's like, you're not snitching because you're not trying to get anybody in trouble. You're talking to somebody because you're worried about them. That's a very different shift, even though the actual end result is the same. So there's some things we have to do within the, the threat assessment space to make sure that everybody is on that same page and that everybody has the, the, the skills to do things like crisis intervention, de-escalation, suicide prevention work. Uh, it's why I think first responders are so valuable in this space. I mean, I really do. I think because many of the things that you do every day are what we wish everybody was doing and could do, you know, being able to de-escalate those tensions, being able to talk people down and understand what's going on in their lives. These are these are such important life skills when we think about this type of uh, violence prevention work. Yeah, and kind of the mention that you talked about, I just feel like in law enforcement and, you know, with the fire service and EMTs, it's, you know, that is still a big stigma is this whole, whole suicidal thing and piece of that and no one wants to snitch on each other. Um, and I think one of the things too for law enforcement I know is I went to a couple of trainings and people are afraid that, 
hey, if anyone finds out that I might be having a hard time here and I'm suicidal, I might get placed on a hold and then I can't carry my gun and then I might be fired or that kind of deal. And then I, I won't have my job anymore. And that is exactly what you're talking about, breaking down those barriers and being able to, you know, remove that stigma so that we can talk about this because we care about each other and kind of move on from there. So um, is there anything else in, in terms of like firefighters and EMTs in this field that could help them out um, when it comes to this topic? Well, I think the, the only other thing I would say is, you know, everything we've talked about in terms of breaking down those barriers, mm -hmm. the stigma, looking out for one another, I think is applicable across the board. The one other thing that we did discover, and we talk about it sort of briefly in the book, but perhaps uh, with hindsight, you know, I, I almost wish we'd gone into a bit more depth on this, is the impact that these types of shootings and these events have on the community at large, but also on our first responders because of the tragedy that they are exposed to and have to deal with. And this is, I think, a very unique challenge that um, our first responders have. So as a firefighter, as an EMT, as a, as a police officer, uh, whatever perspective is, even, let's be honest, if you are the, uh, the trauma surgeon in the hospital, even the doctors, right? You know, it's all very well dealing with, you know, one person getting shot. Just take Las Vegas, for example, where you've got over 50 people killed and hundreds injured. And then you're trying to manage that scene. And, you know, I'm careful not to step too far out of my lane here as I'm the sociologist. Drew, you should be answering this. I know this is your expertise, right? Sure. How, you, how you actually manage that, that crime scene, if you will, and, and everything else. But where I will uh, stay in my lane is to say that is, I think, bar none, the worst day of anybody's career. And, and, and not just career, but, but life, you know? Going into that scene, seeing things that you'll never be able to unsee, experiencing things that you'll never be able to not experience again, so the only takeaway I would have from all of this is not, this is not to scare the listeners, this is to prepare them, which is to say, we have to build within our organizations, within our cultures, the supports necessary. So that if people have been exposed to that much trauma, to that much uh, death and destruction in a community, that we're able to support them as they process what it meant to do that work. And I think it does feed into not just around like, how do we prevent the next one, but also how do we care for the people whose job it is to prevent the next one? So that those people are 100% equipped to be the types of professionals that we want them to be. So everything you mentioned before around the stigma around mental health and everything else, you guys work in this field, you see the, the worst of humanity, right? And, and it's heartbreaking at times. And being okay to say that out loud, I wanna give you permission to say that out loud. Like we ain't judging you, right? We're, we're grateful um, and we're, we're supportive of that. And I think that's the, the key thing here is to say, if you have gone through this, if you have been a first responder at one of these, uh, uh, terrible tragedies. Let's recognize that and let's know that, that they, they might need some help on the back end to process this, uh, to understand it. They might need some support. Um, let's provide them with that support. I think that's really the key thing here as well. Absolutely agree with you. And it's interesting that you mentioned that because I just wrote a blog post a couple of weeks ago that I put up on my website and in there, the, exactly what you just said, 
um, worst day of your life. I have high school students that I teach with every day. And my first day is ask a cop a question and that kind of deal. And I always get the question, you know, what's the coolest call you've ever been on? What's the funniest thing that's ever happened? Then I get, what's the worst call you've ever been on? And I tell them, you know, here's some of the worst calls I've ever been on, but the absolute worst that I could ever go on, I couldn't even imagine would be an active shooter event. And when we train for this, I mean, we try to make it as real as possible so that we are ready uh, when we have to go in and uh, take out the shooter. So, you know, we, we turn up the volume in this uh, school setting or a building or something like that with some screaming and that kind of deal. We have actors on the ground, that kind of deal, so that we're ready for when stress happens, that we're ready in that situation. And speaking of that, like I went and watched this um, series that I thought was really good on Showtime and it's called Active Shooter. And they showed one of the first responders, one of the police officers that was involved with the Pulse nightclub shooting. And the after effect of him that was unbelievable. He um, was on this boat and he couldn't get within two miles of leaving water because it would just mess with his head so much. And he talks about that. And he's just like, I would never want anyone else to go through what I went through. And his wife was saying, she's never heard someone cry like that after that. And that's exactly what you're talking about. I don't think we talk about that enough. It's kind of one of those, well, we'll just kind of move on and we should be dealing with that more because it is such a catastrophic scene that we're having this normal response to an abnormal situation. And we need to talk about that. So I I completely agree with you on that point. It is, I couldn't even imagine going to one of those scenes. I train for it and I prepare for it, but holy cow. I mean, afterwards, that's gotta be tough. So. And and I think that's the other thing is, you know, it's almost broadening that definition a little bit of situational awareness. If you, if you will, you, you need that situational awareness when you're on the scene, when you're on the ground, when you're doing the job, that's what keeps you alive. That's what keeps you safe. That's what, that's what enables you to do your job to the absolute best you can do it. But you also need that situational awareness before and after that scene so that you're looking out for one another, caring for one another, and you can spot what are the warning signs that people are struggling with this. Whether they're struggling with, they too might be on a pathway to violence or maybe self-harm, or they are just really struggling to process the trauma that they've been exposed to in those situations. That for me, that's that's situational awareness, but it's looking at it from this 360 degree perspective, because it's not just what you do nine to five when you're doing the job. It's I'm doing situational awareness all the time because I'm always not necessarily scanning my surroundings for threats. I'm scanning my surroundings for like, How's everyone doing right now? And that right there is how you build a great culture within an organization to be successful, I think. And to your point, too, that thing that I've noticed uh, with our jobs is, you know, you might be a death scene investigator or a police officer, firefighter, EMT, and you've seen death a lot. And it might be you've seen 30 uh, deaths and that 31 might just hit something, something about that sense that maybe that looked like someone you knew, or maybe that looked like your niece or something came up about that. And now that affects you differently. And being able to pick on, pick up on those little key features like that, those cues and clues that, Hey, maybe something's not right here. And I should go talk to them about this because something, even the look on their face, almost that thousand yard stare that I've seen from my partners and just going over there and talking to them huge, because you're right. It, it could be just a situation like this and then it causes that. And we need to be aware of that. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. So, well, uh, I appreciate all that you've had to say about here, James. I've learned a lot. Um, I know that your book was fantastic. I've listened to it. I want to read it now uh, after just listening to it on Audible. And I listened to it on my way home. So it was perfect because I I have about a 45 minute drive home and I I really enjoyed it. So um, I know that it's available on Amazon. Is there any other places that our viewers could go and get that book? Yeah, it's cliche to say, right, where, where all good books are sold, but uh, it is widely available. You know, um, there is a website, which is bookshop.org, which uh, supports local independent booksellers. But of course, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, the big, the big retailers also uh, provided. And, you know, we, we are, we're finalists right now for the Minnesota Book Award uh, for the book which is 
super exciting. We'll find out if uh, we've been successful in April. Uh, apparently, there's you know the, the envelope opening and you, you find out type of thing. Um, but you know the reception for the book has been really really positive and. I think what's been really cool about it is it's provided an opportunity to have these types of conversations uh, where you get to talk to practitioners, you, you get to talk to a broader audience and sort of and say, you know, yeah, it's not a light beach read, you know, uh, to be reading a book about mass shootings and active shooter scenarios. But particularly for practitioners who are in that you know, first responder world. Um, I think there's a lot in there that hopefully uh, changes thinking about it, but also uh, moves us toward prevention. And really, I think all of us are on that same page. So that's important. Fantastic. And are you uh, are you working on anything else related to this topic right now? I know you have a couple books out there. Uh, are you looking at more research in this area or writing another book, something similar to this or? Yeah. I'm glutton for punishment, right. Is uh, <laughs> you, you'd think that one book would be enough, but yeah. So I've got other research projects going on. Some of them looking at sort of gangs and youth violence and, uh, and some other issues, but with regard to this particular work with Active Shooter, we, we are doing a, a few sort of extension projects at the moment, actually. So one of them is looking at how mass shooters use social media more in depth. And that's been really kind of fascinating to sort of see um, the commonalities there and how those warning signs play out in a digital space. And then we're also looking more at that question around threat assessment within school environments. So thinking about how do we optimize threat assessment so that people take threats seriously, but we get the right response to them? So there are projects that we're engaged in at the moment, which kind of, uh, you know, enhance this work and move it forward. And I think the goal is to, you know, keep working in this space and, and hopefully keep making a contribution to it. Fantastic. Well, uh, Rich, did you have any questions uh, in terms of for situational awareness or anything that way? I, I would just like to have you speak a little bit more about this database that you have put together because there's there's a lot of work that has been given to that. Uh, just if somebody wanted to mm, access that or learn more about what you're gathering there, if you'd share a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, the database is publicly available and it's free. So you can download it uh, at theviolenceproject.org. Um, and um, there is a sort of interactive uh, page on there where you can play around with some of the variables, which are probably of most interest. So things like the age or the gender of the, of the, of the uh, shooter, you know, it will come as no surprise that the vast majority are male. Um, for example, for instance, or, or um, where the shootings occurred, you know, in terms of it being a workplace or a school or a place of worship or a restaurant or something like that. But um, but if you download the whole database, it's basically an Excel spreadsheet and you can play around with all of it uh, and, and look at all the different bits of information uh, and, um, you know, sort of choose your own adventure in some ways in terms of how deep you want to go into the analysis of the of the research so it's all available and it's all free at the uh, at the violenceproject.org um, and then also on that same website we do have some resources around threat assessment and around crisis intervention and uh, suicide prevention techniques and other things on a, a sort of spin-off that we call off-ramp and the reason we call it off-ramp is this idea that you can build off-ramps on the pathway to violence. And so that's also available uh, on the website too. Uh, Follow-up question. You said the, major the vast majority of the uh, perpetrators of this type of violence are male. Uh, as I think about it, I can't recall just off of my mind a single incident of a mass shooting event where the perpetrator was female that doesn't mean they don't exist i'm just not thinking of one so just a couple of questions one like what percentage of them are male compared to female because i mm -hmm. i believe it's widely skewed toward male but I, you know i'm just curious on that and then two uh, from your perspective of sociology or your your associate's perspective of psychology uh, what makes males more 
more prone to this type of behavior? Yeah, it's a great question. How long have you got? We could we could do a whole uh, series on this one. No, I'm. We'll just go straight to episode. Episode. Yeah, I was two. Say, coming soon, episode two. No, um, great question. So the 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 uh, the quick answer on the percentages is about ninety eight percent of our database is male. I think there's three women in the database, um, a couple of which actually were working with men. Um, so there's also, in some ways, the standalone female mass shooter is a very rare phenomenon. Your, your, uh, your gut instinct on that was correct. In terms of the reasons why men are more likely to be violent, I think there's a couple of things to think about. This is true both for mass shootings, which are rare events. I mean, they are, they are increasing in frequency and in deadliness, right? More people are dying with mass shooters now than they ever have done. But in the grand scheme of violence, mass shootings are still a rare event versus kind of everyday gun violence in our communities. If you look at everyday violence, if you look at mass shootings, if you look at all of it, men are overrepresented across the board. Um, so then you start to ask that bigger question of, okay, well, what is it about men? And I think the quickest and easiest way to sort of maybe explain this is partly it's biology. Uh, you've got you know, aggression, testosterone. Uh, to some degree, there's an evolutionary aspect of this as well in, in evolutionary psychology. When we think about, you know, how did men become men uh, over, uh, you know, hundreds of years, uh, thousands of years of evolution. Um, you then have a sort of sociological component, which is we are socialized to be more aggressive and violent. We see it in lots of different ways. So for instance, you go to, uh, you know, you go to your, your, your local Walmart or Target and you go uh, uh, shopping for toys, for instance. In the boys aisle, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of guns and superheroes and uh, trucks and, and everything else. You know, it, that's the boy stuff. In the girls aisle, you know, there's a lot of pink, there's a lot of dolls, there's a lot of makeup, but we're not really socializing our girls in that trajectory, if, the, if you get what I mean. So there's something about the culture of being, what it means to be masculine, right? It's tied to being violent and aggressive and, and stuff like that. And then you have a kind of economic dynamic as well, like the history of men being the breadwinner in the family, um, the, then the pain that that creates if you're not. So there is this sort of sense of like catastrophic failure in terms of being a man if you're not living up to the expectations of what it means to be a man. This is, I think, actually really important. We do actually write about this in the second chapter of the book, um, where if you think about these mass shooters, there is an element of sort of this aggrieved entitlement, but also this like failed masculinity that they're grappling with, which is they're not living up to the cultural expectations of what a real man looks like, is, does, both in terms of economics, in terms of, you know, their own uh, relationship with women. I mean, all this stuff, that's part of the crisis that they're experiencing, which is, you know, they're not, um, they're not living up to expectations of what it means to be a, a red-blooded American male. And for some people, the response will be, well, okay, I'll show you just how masculine I can be. And I, I will master the violence that we've sort of told people that they need to be in control of, if that makes sense. So there are sort of these like deep sociological and psychological roots for when we think about what is it that, that is particularly difficult for men and what brings them on that pathway to, to violence. So uh, like I say, in the second chapter of the book, we actually uh, outline some of these things. We talk about them really just the way in which the stresses of everyday life are just felt differently. Um, and that's not to suggest that women don't have a hard time. They absolutely do. And, they, and there's so many examples of that, right? But there's something about masculinity that plays a role in this. It's also one of the reasons as well is uh, one of the big risk factors for this type of violence is also a history of domestic violence and criminal behavior prior, um, because you see that this is about you know 
those types of uh, dynamics. So there's 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 definitely a lot there. Uh, it's a great question. Like I say, we could go on all day, I suppose, with some of it. No, we'll just let them buy the book and learn more. <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> no. The Violence Project, How to Stop a Mass Shooting Epidemic. Check Should it out. I'm go down a route that you might have looked at and you might not have looked at, but it's something that I've always scratched my head and wondered about. And is that, is, is there any plausibility to my informal opinion <laughs> that uh, people that play um, video games of violence can become desensitized to the acts of violence because you shoot somebody and then it's a reset button and everybody's okay again and you're shooting and shooting and killing and killing and shooting and shooting and killing and I gotta think that that does something to the psyche of a person who's, say, you know, very habitually playing these games and exposed to that kind of violence. So that's my informal um, observation on this. Is there any validity to this, or is it just something that I've conjured in my mind? <laughs> you know, I would say this, there is some truth to it, but the way you pitched it actually demonstrates more the truth of it, which is to say that so many people draw a very straight line as if um, it is uh, causal, right? So you play violent video games, you become violent, right? And it's, it's like the straight line. And if that were true, well, Japan would be the most violent country in the world, right? Because uh, there's a lot of video games being played uh, there. Really, the reality of it is that the video games are more like a, a facilitator. So if you've already got all the risk factors, you know, there's childhood trauma, you're in crisis, you, you know, you're, you're angry with the world, you, you, life's falling apart, you're already sort of thinking about maybe shooting somebody and then you start playing a lot of violent video games well then you might see a kind of enhancement effect going on right but it would be false to say that you know if the three of us right now did a quick late night marathon of call of duty that come tomorrow we would be you know uh, cold-blooded killers so to speak so and I, but and, and i i know that sounds very uh, flippant to put it that way but sometimes in the media, that's the presentation of it, right? It's let's not have a serious conversation about the big things because it's all about the violent video games. And what, what I almost want to say is, look, the violent video games probably play a little bit of a role in facilitating this. When you've got somebody whose life is utterly falling apart, who's already angry and is already, you know, purchasing firearms and going to target practice, but... That's not the case with all our kids. Most of our kids are playing these games and they're just fine. Uh, and I think that's the, the key component here. So it has that sort of enhancement component to it, which I think we've, we, we have to kind of understand a little bit better. It's not that causal straight line to say that this is the reason why. Um, but, uh, but we actually do write about that in the book as well. It's, uh, it, we, 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 we cover it a little bit um, particularly in reference to, uh, to school shooters and the role of uh, violent media in, uh, as a facilitator for violence. So it's, it's a great question because it's one that I think comes up a lot. A lot of people think about it. Um, and I think the way you described it speaks to that nuance. It's, you know, it's not that it's a causal factor. It's a, it's a thing of if you've got all those other risk factors, then it might play a role. But it's not the thing that's going to, you know, it's not the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's just, it's something that's kind of there and, and it might be playing a role. Okay. Thank you. Drew, I'm going to kick it back to you to close it out. All right. Well, James, I really appreciate you uh, coming out with us today. Um, I know your work in here is fantastic. And like I said, I, I really look forward to looking at your other books as well. And I, like I said, I, I can't recommend it enough, especially if, even if you're not a big reader, if you like to just have something on like for Audible, that kind of deal. It's a great book, The Violence Project, How to Stop a Mass Shooting Epidemic. Um, I would definitely go out and get it. 
Um, like I said, it's available. And uh, we just really thank you for your time today for, um, you know, providing us this information and uh, helping out public safety as well as civilians to look forward to this kind of stuff and to how to prevent these mass shootings from happening. So thank you very much for coming out, James, and we appreciate having you on the show. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. And thanks to the listeners for the work that they do uh, in this space. Uh, you know, as first responders, it's difficult work and, and just want them to know it's appreciated. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you to our very own certified master instructor and police officer, Drew Moldenauer, for taking the lead and arranging and conducting this interview. And thank you, Dr. Densley, for sharing your findings and lessons of the, your fascinating book with us today. Since the start of the pandemic, we've had some amazing opportunities to present our programs on a virtual platform for groups ranging in size from 6 to 500, with recorded playbacks being viewed over 30,000 times. Here's hoping, fingers crossed, that booster shots will allow us to continue our quest toward some form of normalcy. Thank you to the organizations that have hosted virtual and live situational awareness programs since the start of the pandemic. You know, before the pandemic, I would take this portion of the show to list some of the upcoming events so you'd know where to find us in case you wanted to attend one of the programs. Well, during the pandemic, we didn't have much of a list to share. And uh, that's changing now. So let me help you out to see where we're going to be at so you might be able to know where to join us if you're interested. On March 8th, we'll be at the Maryland Fire Rescue Institute's National Fire Service Staff and Command Program. This will be my 22nd consecutive year presenting for the MIFRI Staff and Command Program, and I'm very honored and thankful for that. March 12 to 17, our associate, Bert Van Leven, uh, who is one of our certified and master instructors, will be at the IFOC Saudi Arabia Conference. March 19 and 20 at Dalran Fire Department in Dalran, New Jersey. March 26, the Nebraska Fire Chiefs Association Conference in Kearney, Nebraska. March 27th, the Buffalo County Mutual Aid Association, also in Kearney, Nebraska. April 9th, the Maryland Fire Chiefs Association Conference in Rockville, Maryland. April 26th and 27th, the Virginia, Maryland and Delaware Association of Electrical Cooperatives in Palmyra, Virginia. April 28th, the Voluntary Protection Programs Participants Association Conference in Las Vegas, Nevada. May 5th, the National Park Service Management Safety Symposium in uh, Yellowstone Park, Montana. May 10 and 11, the Northern Public Power Association Linemen's Safety Seminar in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And the master instructors are also working hard to add their programs to this list as well. You can also view our list of upcoming programs by visiting the essaymatters.com website. If you're interested in hosting a live event or a virtual program, just click the Contact Us tab at the top of the home page and we'll give you a call. Finally, remember to check out our show notes for how to subscribe to our newsletter and how to follow us on social media. There we share ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 389 of the Situational Awareness Matters show is complete. Thank you again to Situational Awareness Matters Master Instructor Drew Moldenauer for serving as our host today. And thank you to Dr. James Densley for sharing your research and lessons from your book with us. It was fascinating. Thank you to our viewers and listeners for sharing some of your valuable time with us today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters Show with Dr. Richard Gassaway. If you're interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit his website, essaymatters.com. If you're interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for a program, or if you would like to be a guest on his show, click the Contact Us tab at the top of the homepage.